So, even though Mother Nature threw everything at us, I'm here. Uh, and I'm here to talk about something that is very fundamental. Not to our belief system. Because it's true. We have no idea where to draw the line between reality and beliefs. Now, so far, belief system is concerned. You have to remember there was a time when people believed that the earth was flat. That was a belief. They didn't know, but they believed. And because they believed, it was also understood that you don't just keep going on the ocean, because if you did, you'll fall off. And you see, that's the problem with the belief. If you didn't travel and you believed, not a problem. But there was a reality that existed and the reality that existed was that the earth was not flat. It was in fact round. And so what difference did it make? But the big difference that it made was all the fear that people had of falling off from earth was not true. That they didn't need to be afraid. That they could venture, they could go places. And they would be okay. In the same way, I find that people have beliefs about what peace is. Now, you, you saw all those videos, this award, that award. But the reality is, I have been speaking on this subject for 52 years. When I first started, my first discourse, I was four years old. It was in September, I would, I would have become five that year, but I was born in December. <laughs> so I was technically four years. <laughs> now, putting it into perspective for me, personally, I left in January, the day of my grandson's birthday. I celebrated his birthday in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I left for this tour. And in his birthday, you know, celebrating his birthday, he was pretty happy. <laughs> but what is peace? If I was to ask him, I don't know what he would say. I'm sure he would say something. Because he's a very bold fellow. So he'd say something. 
I don't know what. Since that time, every single year, multiple times I've been talking to people about peace, about contentment, about the possibility that exists in this life. And I've been in a very unique position. Because there I was, very, very young, and adults forty years, fifty years, sixty years of age would come to argue with me. <laughs> to argue with a little boy. I mean, see, the world has changed. The world has changed. If 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 that was to come out today that this 45-year-old went to argue with a six-year-old, people would be, I mean, that would be a joke. That would be just a joke. But that's what used to happen every single day. I was 13 years of age. When I left India, I went to the West. And that's what happened every day. People would come to argue. Now, I wasn't going to argue with them. I had nothing to argue about because I wasn't living in the world of beliefs. So if you don't learn and live in the world of beliefs, what do you have to argue about? You know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. So, when it comes to peace, what does it take? Where is peace? What kind of peace? Absence of noise? People actually call peace absence of noise. When it gets quiet, if it's really noisy, it gets quiet. Ah, oh, that's so peaceful. So, what is the problem? Have you not heard of earplugs? Why don't we give everybody on this earth earplugs? Seven billion earplugs. And everybody can put earplugs in their ear and then there will be peace, right? Wrong. Very wrong. So what is peace? Peace begins, first of all, with you. Not with the world. Not with your neighbor. Not with the neighbor's dog. But it begins with you. And it's your understanding that becomes so important that it does begin with you. Not a belief system, but to know that it begins with you. That when you are in that place of peace, then all is well. All is right. All is correct. I'll tell you a little story. I've been telling this story in India, in Nepal, so I'll tell it to you here too. There was a king, and he was going to go in battle the next day. And he realized that he could die. And he wanted so very badly to go to heaven. So all night long he kept thinking, what is heaven? What is hell? What is heaven? What is hell? 
Next day, he suited up, got on his horse, off he went. Big army following him. And in his mind, he keeps asking himself, what is heaven? What is hell? What is heaven? What is hell? He saw a wise man coming from the other direction. He said, ah, he must know. Kicked his horse, went over there with his armor and everything ready, suited for war. And he looks at the wise man and says, hey, wait. So the wise man stopped. The king dismounted went over to the wise man and said, I have a question for you. And I'm sure you can tell me. I want to know what is heaven and what is hell. And the wise man said, sorry, king. I don't have the time. I'm on my way somewhere. I don't have the time. Upon hearing this, the king was furious. Don't you know who I am? I'm the king. You don't have time for the king? And I just asked you a simple question that you should know the answer to. And how dare you? All you say to me is, I don't have the time. The wise man looked at the king, smiled, and said, King, now you are in hell. <laughs> All this anger that you have, you're in hell. Immediately the king was like, wow, wow, he realized. Oh my God, this is a wise man. And what he just said is so profound. So profound. So he immediately dropped to his knees. Thank you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you. I was so arrogant, I, I had no idea. But what you have just done for me, what you have just told me, is amazing. I'm in debt. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the wise man looked at him and said, King, now you are in heaven. <laughs> so, It's a little simple story. But some of you clapped. I don't like to assume. So does that mean you agree with this story? I don't want to assume. I could have assumed, oh yeah, they liked it, they agreed with it. Did you, do you agree with this? Well, let's have a show of hands then. <laughs> Some of you. In fact, the, only the minority. The rest of you disagree with this story? <laughs> you don't like the story or you disagree with the story, what? Do you agree with this story or do you disagree with the story? Well, you have to make up your mind. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? And you have come here to hear about peace. Truly. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? 
I'm not talking about liking the story. It's a cute little story, that's besides the point. So when the wise man said, now you are in hell. Was he right? But, wait a minute. I thought hell was this place where you got boiled, <laughs> baked, fried, cut up. I mean, severely painful. And this man, this king, is not being fried. Well, not physically. But he is in anger. He's angry. And the wise man says, now you are in hell. Do you agree with that? So if you do agree with that, how many times a day do you go to hell? Once, twice, three times. Easy for you to get mad, right? Easy for you to get upset. And then he says, when the man, when the king is full of gratitude, he says, now you are in heaven. How many times a day do you feel gratitude? Now, therefore, some of you are wondering, right? About what? <laughs> okay. Let's take the simplest one. All right? Simplest one. Of all the things you could be thankful for, what would be one that is obvious? I mean, really obvious. I mean, simple. You're alive. A lot of people don't think like that. They want to be thankful for the lottery ticket. They want to be thankful for good wife. They want to be thankful for good job. They want to be thankful for good husband. They want to be thankful for everything else. But nobody looks at the importance of being alive. Till it's too late. Till it is too late. So, do you know how to feel gratitude for being alive? Or do you find that a conflict too? That life is full of all these challenges and miseries and problems. How can I be thankful for that? Do you find it challenging? Do you have problems? So what if I told you? that being alive is one thing and having problems is another. What would you say to that? Being alive is one thing, having problems is another. There's a limited amount of time. You were born, you're alive, and one day you're gonna go. In this, many things will happen. These are all variables. 
Some days will be problematic, some days will be great, some days will be very happy, some days won't be so happy, some days will be wow, some days will be oh no, some days... You see, this is all variable. And this is here for a little while, but it's here. It's day and it's night. And without this, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> if you're not alive, do you have problems? No. If you're not alive, that's the biggest problem you've got. <laughs> you're not alive anymore. <laughs> Did people get the two mixed up? Confusion. Beliefs. Beliefs. This something bad is happening to me because I must have done something bad in my last lifetime. Do you know what it was? You know, the way I look at it is for all those people who believe in their karma, I don't want to know what I did bad. I really don't. I find myself so fortunate that I can go around the world and talk to people about peace. I want to know what I did right. I, I have very good memory. I really do. But not that good of what I did in my last lifetime. Was I, an, I, was I an eggplant? Was I a tomato? Was I a cauliflower? I have no idea. Belief systems have this problem for me, that they steal reality from Of all the wishes that I have, the most profound wish is to be content, is to be fulfilled. The other day, I had an epiphany. I was lying in, on the bed and it was pretty late. I said, my goodness. What would happen if there was no gravity? It'd be a disaster. Disaster. You know, all the ocean would be floating. And the sharks would be in the air. <laughs> and as human beings, we would be floating too. And there would be no end to it. You float away. House wouldn't mean anything. I mean, you, would, you can get it on your bed. You, you would be stuck to your ceiling. You couldn't take a shower. You wouldn't even be able to use the toilet properly. <laughs> because if you evacuated just air, that would be thrust and you would just go like a rocket <laughs> and hit the ceiling. It's a good thing there's gravity, don't you? Without gravity, it would be all a chaos. Now, how many temples there are to gravity? Have you seen one? It's a power. You don't see it. It's there. Extremely important. And how many people pay homage to this incredible power?
We are incapable of realizing that power, all the powers that truly affect us every day. Every day. But off we go as the learned ones who know everything. Because they've flipped a few pages in a book. That's what Kabir says. The whole world, all these people, you know, they've read this, 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 but did not read the two and a half words of love, the way it's written in Hindi. That if they would have understood love, they would have understood the meaning of it all. The love. The love to be alive. The love to want to know. The love to want to understand. The love that the drop of water has to join the ocean once again. Do you want to know about love? You have no idea what love is. Sorry. I came across a couplet from Rahim. It's also around the time of Kabir in India. And he says, and in this couplet, that the net is cast, the net is cast, the fish is caught in the net, and the water keeps going, keeps moving. So, first, the water and the fish must love each other, right? I mean, inseparable in a way, the fish is from the water, and the water holds it, gives it life, gives it everything that it needs, flows. But when the net is cast, the fish is caught, and the water keeps flowing, giving up any affection, any love towards the fish. But even then, the fish does not want to lose its connection with the water. This is what Rahim says is love. Unconditional. In this day and age, or oh, you betrayed me. But the fish does not go. You betrayed me. Even in that, fish yearns for that water. You have a yearning, a yearning to be fulfilled, and that yearning will not go away till you are. No matter how many distractions you place in front of you, you will not be able to forget that inner thirst that surfaces again and again and again and again. again. 
How strong is the want of that one drop to meet back with the ocean? How strong? How strong? That little drop really just became steam, floated up, condensed, became a cloud, traversed thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands of miles, fell, and some of it fell in places where it froze. Ah, froze. Now it's trapped, right? Or is it? Nope, like a glacier. Have you seen a glacier? Have you heard of a glacier? It moves like a river, very slowly, but it moves. And all those drops that are caught in that glacier, even though they are frozen, they're moving. And where are they going? To meet once again from that source that is the ocean. And they will. They will. Purity. <laughs> Purity. All that water that's in that glacier, all that water that is the rain, it's pure. It's not salty. Ah, oh, and shouldn't, shouldn't that drop say, I don't want to mix with you. I am pure and you are not. After all, the ocean is salty. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. The want is so strong to join that ocean again that being salty or being pure is not an issue. Because this is simply how it is. Do you know? And do you understand that? There are no dividing lines. Like the breath. That it comes. And it goes. And it comes. And it goes. And it comes and it goes as though it was one continuous garland. One continuous garland. When you begin to address that want that dynamics of that drop that wants to join the ocean and nothing will hold it back, then you begin to understand what peace is all about. That you, too, are a part of that that is And to join it, to want it, to be with it. The desire is so prevalent that when that process is not happening, that is what creates the deficit the lack of peace.
That's what creates the lack of peace. And when that process is happening, then peace is there. <laughs> peace doesn't need to be manufactured. Peace doesn't need to be created. Peace doesn't need to be transported. Peace doesn't have to come from anywhere else. Every single human being on the face of this earth has peace. It's already there. And then people go, what about world peace? What about world peace? Do you know that in the old days, there was all these palaces, and in fact, even Versailles in France. And where Versailles was built was lowlands, like a marsh. And the stench was unbelievable. You've heard of eau de toilette. You know why it is called eau de toilette? It was water you put in the toilet because it wasn't flushed. Until somebody came along and, and, and dumped it in a cart, it just sat there and stank. That's how it was. In Versailles, one of the kings decided that they wanted to have lots of plants, nice smelling flowers to mask the smell of all that stench that was out there. This is what the world does. Everybody is busy in masking the stench and I am saying, why are you masking the stench? It's not going to help. Get rid of that which stinks. What stinks? What has the worst stench on the face of this earth? Do you know? So, listen from a person who has been talking about this for a little over half a century. I'll tell you what stinks. Ignorance. Ignorance stinks. It is the worst possible stench you can have. Knowledge is exquisite because it gets rid of that what stinks so. Let me tell you a story. Actually, this isn't a story. This really happened. There's a guy in Colombia, and he sells things door to door. Just little things, whatever he can. No multinational corporation involved here. Just whatever he can sell. He pedals door to door. And he loves my message. He just loves to hear it. He loves to talk about it to other people. And so as he goes from door to door, not only he carries whatever his little gadgets that he wants to sell, but he also in his backpack carries a lot of pamphlets and little documents and DVDs and different things so that he can give to people as he comes across people who may, who may be interested. So one day, while he's going door to door, he ends up in this neighborhood that's pretty bad, really rough neighborhood. And somehow, his bag gets 
stolen. Now, of course, his livelihood is in there. So he starts looking, searching for the bag. And he's searching here, searching there, searching there, searching there. And finally, he goes to one of these back streets. And guess what he sees? There's somebody sitting on the side of the road with his bag, reading <laughs> this material. So he goes up to him and he says, that's my bag, you stole it. And he looks at him. And he said, this is the best thing I have stolen <laughs> in my whole life. Now, when I heard this story, I thought it was very funny and I was very touched. Now, I know there are people here, very judgmental. No, no, he was a thief. But even in his dark life, when the lamp was lit, it brought light. You see, we sit there and draw all these lines. Ah, but you're a sinner. Excuse me. Excuse me. If you lit a lamp in the house of the holiest of holies, what do you think that lamp would do? Hmm? What do you think that lamp would do? Come on, this is not rocket science. You know what lamp does, right? Brings light. It'll bring light. And if that lamp was lit in the house of the greatest sinner on the face of this earth, what do you think that lamp would do? What? Bring light? No. Of course you are. You're, you're confused. <laughs> how, could, how could that lamp bring light? Shouldn't that lamp know this is the sinner of the century. He deserves no light. Ah. Ah. Holy of holies and the sinners. Every day the sun gets up in the morning. You think the sun discriminates? Not you. The wind blows. You think the wind discriminates? The rain rains, you think the rain discriminates. The snow falls, do you, not here in Malaysia, but snow falls. <laughs> do you think it discriminates? The ocean, do you think it discriminates? Uh, no. Why? 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 Then, do. You want me to tell you? You're not going to like the answer. Because of ignorance. The world fights. The intellectuals use their intellect to come up with an excuse for fighting. In politics is very important. One, and, and today because the politics plays out in the media and everything else, you have to have buzzwords. If you don't have buzzwords, like, you know, when they were going off and um, <laughs> going to have all these wars, 
uh, in the Middle East, and it was freedom this and freedom that. And have they freed anybody? No. So they come up with the buzzwords, and then they sit down in the think tank rooms and come up with, well, how are we going to deal press-wise? I mean, what are we going to say to legitimize what we are doing? So they come up with all these fancy words and fancy this and fancy that. And people believe it. Nobody looks through it and goes, hmm. That's what it is. People fight. And people go, it's okay. Why? Because of the buzzwords. Because of the nice little explanation somebody came up with. And nobody says, that is unacceptable. Double. How many of you have kids? More than one. You have to have more than one for this example to work. <laughs> one won't work. <laughs> but even if you don't have kids, you have seen this happen. I'm sure if you are part of a multi, you know, number family, you've probably seen this. So one brother is fighting with the other brother and the parent comes in the room, what's the parent going to say? You don't know? <laughs> All right. When I had kids, when they were very young, now they're much older, so I don't have to do any of that, but when they were young, we ran our house a little bit differently, apparently from here. Um, when the kids were fighting, we would go and say, don't fight. I don't know if that, they do, do that here too? In your household? <laughs> That's how we used to do it. Don't fight. Have you as a parent ever gone to your kids and said, don't fight? Or you've heard of a parent say, but what happens immediately when it says, don't fight, why are you fighting? What happens? Do you know what happens? One of the kids says, she or he did this to me. <laughs> and what does the parent say? I don't care. Don't fight. Right? You re you, would you really, as a parent, go, wow, she took your pencil? Beat her up. <laughs> she tore your bag? Do you need a gun? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Don't. How come adults, when they completely become adults and have some power, don't play by the same rules that they apply for their kids in their own home? You want to know why? Ignorance. Ignorance. No knowledge, all ignorance. This is how it has to be. This is how it has to be. This is how it has to be. There's more people going around this world telling you how their peace cannot happen. And I say to them, okay, this little engine you have here, this is all the horsepower it has. This is after all this time, you figured out that there cannot be peace. Instead of trying to figure out, hey, let's work together to have peace. 
Whatever it takes. No, what they, all their wisdom, all the wisdom on the face of this earth, they've boom, come to the great conclusion. There can never be peace. That's it. That's it. If the captain, you board an airplane and the captain comes out and says, I don't want to fly today. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Would you be upset? Of course. Of course. But here is your opportunity to understand, not with ignorance, but with knowledge of what that peace is that dances in the heart of every human being. The vulnerability of this life, of this existence, is too much. Just saw MH370. I'm a pilot. Something's like, oh my God, what happened? It's horrible. 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 I mean, it is not easy. You know, any, any, any captain with two cents worth of brain and salt will sit there and try to recoup the situation any which way because he doesn't want anybody to get hurt. He doesn't want to hurt his passengers, he doesn't want to hurt himself, and he doesn't want to hurt his airplane. And I hope someday it comes out what happened so that the lives would not be just in vain, but people could learn and, and move forward. There's many lessons to be learned. And one of the lessons to be learned is how vulnerable we all are. How vulnerable we all are. Plans, yes, it's okay. But the priority has to be to be in heaven every single day. Because in reality, what option do you have? You are the drop that wants to join the ocean. Hmm, how little is the drop? How big is the ocean? How much distance has to be traversed? But if there is a sincere desire to join, then there are ways through which it happens. And every single day, the drop makes it back and joins the ocean. And the cycle gets complete. That is the fundamentals of you and I, of us human beings. Until that happens, we will yearn for peace but we will not know it. Ignorance will cast its dark shadows upon the hearts of people, upon the intellects of people. Then, message of hope, like a lit lamp, to remove that darkness to lift the influence of ignorance. So everyone on the face of this earth can feel peace.
and contentment. Because one of the most beautiful gifts that peace brings is joy. And it is joy that fills every part of a human being. It becomes complete. It becomes real. Life becomes real instead of expectations. Instead of dreams, it becomes real. Every day, it's not a challenge. The challenge begins. Can I accept every single day in its entirety? Not 5%, not 2%, all of it. That I awaken. I awaken. To be awake. Another one from Darya. He says, the whole world is asleep and no one is awake. Only those who are awake and awakened. Awake being awake. Awakened whilst awake. Double awake. <laughs> are truly the only ones that are awake. Rest, everybody is sleeping. To awake to a reality that is beautiful that is simple, that is real. That's what the message of peace is all about. That's what peace is all about. That's what reality is all about. You can know it. You can know it. That's what knowledge is. So I know it's quite late. Well, it's not that late. <laughs> it depends where you have to go, right? <laughs> but it actually took me longer to come here from Kuala Lumpur than it took me to fly from Kathmandu <laughs> to Kuala Lumpur by a few hours. So that was interesting. <laughs> but thank you for coming. And I hope you find that knowledge and you find that there is, of course, information if you are interested uh, in knowing more about it. Because that's what I do. My words are not empty. That's the difference. A lot of people go, well, I've heard these words before, so what's the difference? Well, the difference is I stand behind what I say. <laughs> Since I was eight years old, I have being behind what I say. So thank you very much and good night.